Hi, my name is Lorna Lee, and I'm the founding editor of Mariri Magazine. And um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Mark Plotkin, who is a renowned ethnobotanist that has been actively conserving rainforest territories in Latin America and working with the indigenous peoples uh, to do so, leveraging um, new technologies and uh, uh, mapping capabilities to um, be able to help them conserve and protect their ancestral territories. Mark Plotkin is the president of the Amazon Conservation Team and I have him with me and he will answer a few questions about the work of his organization. So Mark, thank you for joining us today. I would love for you to tell us about the work of the Amazon Conservation Team and why your organization is so unique um, in the work that you do for um, indigenous rights and um, rainforest conservation. Well, we work in partnership with indigenous peoples at the Amazon Conservation Team. We've done this with 27 tribes and successfully protected over 43 million acres of rainforest. Uh, in our estimation, if you look at the Amazon, 5% is in national parks, 25% is indigenous lands. And where there's Indians, there's rainforest, where there's rainforest, there's Indians. That's why we partner with these people, because you need the Indians to protect the rainforest, you need the rainforest to protect the Indians. What do you think the indigenous peoples are key to rainforest conservation? Well, indigenous peoples have a connection to the rainforest, which is uh, it just a, a link that nobody else has. Not just that they needed to make their weapons, not just that they needed to make their hammocks, not just that they needed to make their beds, not just that they needed to hunt fish, but also because there's a spiritual and medical connection. So these people will lay down their lives to protect the rainforest in a way that park arts often will not do. I mean, if you're a gold miner looking for a place to do illegal activities, are you going to work in a national park to whose closest guards are 150 miles outside the park? or in an area that has 4,000 pissed off Indians armed with poison tipped arrows? The answer is obvious. What have you found to be the best means or strategies to enable indigenous peoples to fight deforestation and protect their rights to ancestral territories? I think the bottom line, Lauren, in working with indigenous peoples is empowerment. I know it sounds trite, but look, I don't live in the rainforest, and they do. I don't have the cosmological connection to the rainforest that the shamans do. I'm learning, but I'm not there yet. So the bottom line is if you can teach them how to protect the forest, you can teach them who in the military is their ally, you can teach them what laws they can rely on, you can give them access to legal capability, you can put them on Google Earth to see from a bird's eye view, a satellite's eye view, what's happening all around them, you've essentially done your job. So it's not just about handing it all over to the Indians any more it is than telling them what to do, because that never works given human nature. It's about working with them, it's about being patient, it's about going hunting and fishing with them and going through their ceremonies, listening to them and trying to help them. And I'll tell you, it's really, it's the spiritual boomerang, because the more you help these people, the more they help you. What role can emerging technologies play? And how has Amazon Conservation Team used new technologies to empower indigenous peoples uh, to further rainforest conservation? Well, the idea of indigenous mapping is not a new one. And there's maps everywhere there's indigenous peoples, be it Canada or the Congo rainforest. But what we pride ourselves on doing is using the most modern technology, which is GPS on the ground, hooked up with Google Earth, and also getting the Indians to do the work so there's ground truthing like it doesn't exist anywhere else. And they get them to work in partnership and sometimes with the military. So you're building alliances. You know, doing a map for Indians and then going in there and slamming it down on the desk of some government bureaucrat and saying, here's the map, give us our land, is much less uh, productive than sort of seducing them shamanically into forming partnerships with uh, uh, unlikely partners, but ones that can pay off in the long term. And that's what we pride ourselves on doing. Can you describe a little more about how Google Earth has helped um, your project and helped indigenous peoples understand what's going on in their land? Well, you know, Teddy Roosevelt said, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick, and that's usually interpreted in martial terms. But it's not all that alien to what we're doing, which is to say, hey, we're doing this work, we're working with the Indians, and Google Earth is looking over our shoulder. That makes people pay attention. Google and Google Earth is a big player in the global marketplace, a big player in information systems, uh, got the attention of technophiles everywhere. And when you have a partnership with them, it gives you uh, a, a global attention. It puts you on the cover of the San Francisco paper. It gets people at National Public Radio, uh, all the Twitter. Uh, in ways that you just can't do as a, a, a small group of do-gooders, no matter how many tribes you're partnering with. 
So we like to form alliances that can further us down the path in ways that are uh, maybe a little unlikely when you first think of it. A lot of environmental organizations think about, okay, what environmental organization do I need a partnership with? And I'm thinking, shit, I know what they know. I'd rather bring in some cartographic experts. I'd rather bring in some human rights experts. I'd rather bring in some water quality experts. Because there, they have knowledge that I don't have. It's why you work with shamans. I don't know what they do, but I know stuff about how to work with the media and how to fundraise that they don't do. So that's the kind of alliance we're looking for. Complementary talents, not, you know, polishing the polish. So in your opinion, based on this work that you're doing, this very unique perspective you have, what do you think the best way is to protect rainforests these days? The answer is there's no answer. There's no best way to protect the rainforest. You can't put a fence around it and figure it's protected. You can't have the area demarcated and think it's protected. You can't just give the Indians GPS and think it's protected. You know, the big mistake in the environmental movement, really, Lorna, is you win a battle and you think you've won the war. You set up a national park and you think, case closed, and you go home. Bullshit. You know, you go from one battle to the next battle to the next battle. I mean, they wanted to mine gold near Yosemite or Yellowstone recently. It's outside the park, but the fumes would have gone into the park, would have destroyed the vegetation. They would have been run off into the rivers. And if, if, if areas like this, you know, we still got to worry about, how are we going to do it in the Amazon? So the answer is that you got to be vigilant, you got to be lucky, you got to partner with the locals, Indians, peasants, campesinos, government officials, and just know that over the horizon around the bend is going to come a threat that you didn't think of. Look, 30 years ago when I got into rainforest conservation, people would say to me, we can't worry about the rainforest, we got to worry about population growth. The population growth is what was eating up the rainforest. Now they say to me, well, we can't worry about the rainforest, we have to worry about climate change. Well, what's the number four or five cause of climate change in the world? Burning down the Amazon. The bottom line is it's all connected. So if you're interested in new medicines from nature, or if you're interested in human rights, or if you're interested in climate change, or if you're interested in poverty alleviation and prevention, they're all connected. So this idea that we have to save the rainforest and then worry about climate change, or we have to stop climate change and then worry about the ice caps, you know, you need a full court press. It's not easy. That's the, the only approach that's going to work. What do you recommend that we ordinary people can do um, in our lives, you know, in the United States, for example, in the West? What can people that don't live in the rainforest do to support your work or um, things, you know, choices? What choices could we make to lessen our impact on what goes on uh, in the rainforest today? It's a very difficult question, and you know, often when I speak in Berkeley, the first question I ask is, who eats tofu to save the rainforest? All these hands go up, and then I show this picture of the Shingu. On the top half of the picture, it's pristine rainforest. On the bottom half of the picture, which is outside the Indian Reserve, it's nothing, no trees. Why? They cut it down to plant soil. So you're better eating beef than eating tofu in this particular case. But the important issue here is there's no magic button to push, there's no one thing to buy or not buy, there's no magic letter you write to your senator or congresswoman that's going to do this all. Conservation begins at home, okay? We need to worry about clean water, we need to worry about primary forests right here in California or Eastern Europe or wherever we are. But since 9-11, for better or worse, mostly for worse, we know that we live in an ever-shrinking planet. And what happens overseas, like cutting down the rainforest, impacts us here at home, like climate change. So I think, you know, uh, think globally uh, and act locally and globally, not one or the other. So I encourage people to support local organizations, even if it's stream cleanup, it's not romantic, but it needs to be done, but also to support overseas organizations. The Amazon Conservation Team just got Charity Navigator's highest rating. You can't buy that for love nor money, which means the Amazon Conservation Team is the most efficient and most effective organization in the rainforest business. There may be others as efficient as effective, but nobody better. And nobody does what we do because nobody has the partnerships with the Indians, nobody has the partnerships with the shamans that we have. Our methodology works. Four million dollars a year, we protected 43 million acres of rainforest, and there's much more to be done. But we need the resources to do it. We built a Ferrari. It's the finest machine in the rainforest conservation business. We need more gas in the tank. We need more help. We need more money. So yeah, it's great to have people offer to volunteer. We don't have any programs like that. It's great for people to write letters to Congress people. There's a need for that. What we need is resources. We get $5 from bake sales. We get $100,000 over the transom from somebody that sold their business. We cherish every donation, and we put it to good work.